welcome to the talk of Malware is Red Herring, the Real Enemy is at Its Source. Um, it's going to be very dynamic, so please don't be afraid uh, to raise your hand, ask me questions. This is part of uh, uh, the fun and uh, how we're going to enjoy this uh, talk as much as we can. I want to give you, through the talk, a more perspective from the attacker side. We're going to try to look um, on the whole attack chain and then what things we need to evade, how we build attacks, how, how this whole ecosystem works, okay? Um, and we're going to focus on what, what I call the source, so like how we deliver the malware, how we get it inside, and all that world that's around it. A bit about myself. Um, Shlomi Levine, I live in Tel Aviv, I'm Israeli. Um, I grew up there, uh, originally from Texas. Um, and I served for almost six years in the Army, in the Intelligence Division. Uh, dealing with cybersecurity and that uh, kind of thing. Um, and then I worked in the industry, and currently I'm the CTO and co-founder of Perception Point. Um, okay, and uh, I like giving the other side of the attacker's uh, view in order to learn as much as we can. Okay, so a bit about what we're gonna talk today. Um, exploits, what they are, exploitation techniques specifically is how we leverage exploits, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that kind of stuff. Um, so it's gonna get very technical. Um, why it's important, and then the evolution of this kind of thing, um, how we kind of use these things, or how uh, the, security um, the security solutions nowadays uh, catch, or would catch um, malwares, and that's why people reverted to the source, and we're gonna talk about that concept, or basically how the bad guys started evading uh, the techniques out there. Um, and then we're gonna top it off a bit with, uh, with the approach at Perception Point. All right, so, so let's get started. Um, okay, so we'll start with a bit of uh, definitions. So what is an exploit? So an exploit means um, that uh, there is a vulnerability. It actually means a vulnerability. Uh, there's, a vino of, there's a vulnerability in software um, which is exploited by uh, an attacker. And the exploit is the weaponized um, end result of this uh, using the vulnerability in order to gain code execution. Code execution in, a, in, a, in the terms of, uh, of, this, of our world means controlling a computer, okay? The essence of, a, of an attacker is always to gain control of the CPU, which means the CPU is what every computer of ours has and it executes code and it's always who's in control of what the CPU is executing. The name of the game in hacking or attacking or breaking networks is always taking control of the CPU, and then we're gonna talk a lot about how you take control of the CPU. What are the techniques that are done? So the technique is what we call the exploitation technique is how using a vulnerability, you, con you convert the vulnerability into taking control of the CPU. Um, and that's, that's that's the two definitions. Are there any questions about uh, the things? Very cool. Um, okay, so now there's a couple of uh, types of, um, it's more of a marketing thing, but um, uh, the, just to get to, um, just to coordinate this talk with, uh, with the industry, I guess, we'll say. Um, you have a vulnerability, and you can use it in order to get run code on someone's machine, right? So. Uh, let's always revert to a, uh, an easy example. Um, uh, a program, a parser, uh, let's say PDF parser, Adobe Reader, uh, it gets input, um, so there's a vulnerability in the program, the Adobe Reader program, I don't know, someone made a mistake, so this is the vulnerability, and then the input is a PDF file, um, and then the PDF file leverages uh, this vulnerability by creating some kind of confusion in the software, and then uh, an exploitation technique is used, code execution initiates, and then um, malware is installed and so forth, and this is the whole, that's the whole attack chain in, in three seconds. Um, a zero day just means that that vulnerability, the specific one that I'm talking about, a specific vulnerability has not been seen uh, or known about by the vendor. So which means if, um, if no one's seen it before, or there's no, if the vulnerability still exists in the software, um, it can be leveraged. Why, what does this mean? What, what do you mean when I, when you ask the question of like, how is the vulnerability still open? So, you know, we have uh, updates of software and that kind of stuff. It just means that the vendor isn't aware, so therefore he didn't issue a patch or close this bug in his software 
in order to uh, not let people attack through that vulnerability. It's like uh, leaving a door, uh, open door. So then what happens if you have a patch for a vulnerability? Okay, so the program has been updated, but, that, but the old program is still installed in, in people's computers over like somewhere in the internet. So then that, um, that sample or that specific attack will be called an end day, which means there's, uh, since the zero day, it, it comes, the, the terms are coined from a patch management on how long you have until it, you issue a patch. Um, so end day means it's been already issued, but no one, um, and it's closed, and zero day means it hasn't been issued yet and, um, and no one knows about. Um, they still leverage vulnerabilities and exploit. It just depends on what the software state is in the victim that you're trying to attack. And then there's whole industry regarding uh, patch management lifecycle and, uh, and um, vulnerability awareness programs in your organization and networks, but that's not what I'm, I'm discussing. These are just the terms. So zero day, no one's seen it before. It can probably get into every network. End day, depending on the, the, person, um, is the person's deployment, if he is running old software or not, and then you can get in. Um, so that's basically the, the thing. Okay, so I just spoke about before uh, uh, the, the, the kill chain, right? The kill chain is a term that came from, just from experience from looking at how attackers get into networks. So they start by reconnaissance, right? We want to know what the attackers, uh, what the victims are running in their networks, okay? What are the points where we can uh, interact with? Um, and when we talk about actually breaking into the systems themselves, we usually want to target people inside the network, right? So compute, so endpoints. Um, so, I mean, there's different approaches, I won't go into it, but like network scanning from the outside, or you can um, actually talk to the people who work inside and then provide them with input content into the parsers, Office, Word, all those kind of programs, browsers, and exploit vulnerabilities. So what does the attacker do? Um, he, first of all, target acquire, which means he looks for whatever gain, um, whatever gain he wants to do. So it's espionage or financial or uh, hacktivism or whatever he wants to gain. Uh, and then he finds a target. Um, and then he has to study about this target, um, its digital uh, footprints, what we call, or his uh, awareness on the, in like how he looks on the internet, what, he, what are email addresses, what are assets, uh, digital assets that he have online, and learn as much as he can. Um, when he has a clue about what, now, uh, it, there's an interesting um, dynamic here that I want to talk about because end days can, if you have very good intelligence about what the guy's running, then you can maybe use an end day. But if you don't, a zero day will give you much more uh, covered. Like you don't really know, have to know what he's running because probably the zero day would, uh, would succeed. So it's all about of like probability of how you can um, exploit the target or not. Once you have a target and you kind of know what he's running or you want to guess what he's running or something like that, then you have to find a vulnerability. So organizations in, um, uh, around the world, or it can be single people or real teams of, uh, I mean, I don't know if you heard, like uh, governments today really invest a lot in, in this uh, thing and there's a lot of offensive companies that are doing this kind of stuff where they, put, they sit down guys and they say, all right, find us a bug in a program. So they sit down and they take, let's say, a famous program on a word um, Office, uh, right, Microsoft Office, uh, Word, and they look and look and look until they find a vulnerability, okay? So this is the first step of finding a bug in the software. And then um, uh, once they find this, they weaponize it, and we're going to talk about the, um, exactly what you do and um, how the defenses were and all the history of that world. Um, and then what they do is they kind of deliver that content once it's weaponized to the victim. So they send it via um, collaboration or messaging or email, I don't know, a Dropbox or a Slack message or a, uh, a email directly to the person or try and get him to trigger the content on their, his computer. And there's a lot of uh, interesting ways of doing that. Um, and then uh, what happens is the, the attacker, the victim triggers the, um, the input. The exploitation technique uh, happens. Um, computer, uh, the CPU of the computer is hijacked by the attacker, that's the exact point. And then we have the malware installation um, where you deliver the malware into the, inside the computer. And then the malware stages of where it phones home, um, and then command and control, and then working, and then there's a whole different world of there of data exfiltration and lateral movement and making them not find you that you're there and, and all kinds of really, really cool techniques that there's a lot of literature uh, around the internet about. Um, cool. 
So that's basically the whole world of, uh, of hacking uh, and how uh, the bad guys uh, do it. Actually, it, it, gets even, it gets even bigger. I worked for a company called uh, Trustier. Uh, where we were doing um, online banking Trojans. That's what we were fighting guys who were, you know, doing this whole stage. And then the malicious command control stage, they were installing banking Trojans. So all they were looking for is for you to surf to your browser, uh, to your bank. And then once you surf to your bank, they would steal money. And then there's more. Then they have to find mules and, and um, I say, launder the money and, 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 uh, and that whole stage. So it's another whole world, which is quite interesting. Okay, so now... Um, if we kind of look at, uh, at the volumes of these things on the internet, um, you can see that malware variants come out in the, in the millions every month. Why? Because you have a uh, piece of code, or a program actually, and you can mutate it in almost an infinite amount, amount of ways. It's not really infinite because uh, x86 is a closed uh, number of uh, commands that you can do and permutations. But um, the idea is that you can make a really, really, really big a uh, group of um, variants, and therefore the industry, if, if I'll put a, a word about the industry, the industry has been always, um, in the 90s or 2000s, it was always, security was based on signature. So the thing is, do I know you, right? Uh, uh, content comes in, I look, all right, do I know you or do I not know you? Or have I seen you before, have I not seen you before? If I have, if I have seen you before, then I know, but what happens if there's millions of you. <laughs> so how do I know how to tag every time you change a bit? So, so that kind of um, diffused and bypassed that thing. The exploits, on the other hand, they grow very, very slowly. Exploitation techniques, okay? Exploits themselves, vulnerabilities, there's always going to be vulnerabilities. Why? Because software is very, very complex and uh, finding all the vulnerabilities in software is a very, very hard problem in computer science. Um, so there's always going to exist. The question is these exploitation techniques, how you gain control of the CPU, I'm going to get into that in the future of this presentation, um, is there are only about one or two techniques come out a year. Okay, so it's very, very slow. And that's at the bottom of the, the delivery mechanism, right, when the attacker sends you the content and it exploits your computer. So there's not many techniques that you can use. Um, and, and, and that's why it's an interesting thing to look at. It's basically the root of this triangle that we're looking at. Okay, um, just uh, a bit about um, the vulnerabilities over the years. Um, so back in the 90s, it started uh, um, one of the first famous um, articles by Aleph One, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. People understood that they can break software and over take over the, the CPU. And that's when we started seeing um, attacks uh, and it started increasing, increasing, increasing. And then um, a solution came out. I'm going to talk about this uh, in a bit. And kind of a decline in the, in the exploits being seen because the exploitation technique was countered in this uh, feature here, right here, NXBit it's called. And I'll explain why soon. And then um, a new tech exploita uh, exploitation technique that bypasses the the. End, the this, the annex bit came out, and then we've seen a rise. And this game, this cat and mouse game, always kind of goes on. And, and we're going to dive into what this cat and mouse game is and, and how, it's, how it's played. OK. Um, why is all this stuff important? <laughs> um, OK. So the landscape, to, talking about the landscape of, uh, of, um, of the delivery of malware, so the attacker has kind of um, two ways of delivering um, the expo the, his content into your computer. Two kind of vectors of exploitation, right? So one would be memory corruption, which means with the one that I spoke about until now was called memory corruption bugs. You find a vulnerability in a program, you corrupt the memory, you take over the CPU, and then you run your own code. And then another class of uh, bugs is called logical bugs, where it's actually a feature inside the program. It wasn't intended to execute code, but um, that's what uh, I mean. That's what the attacker found that he can bend the rules a bit and kind of uh, uh, install malware using these kind of logical bugs. A good um, a demonstrate a good example for these kind of attacks would be uh, macros in Word documents. Macros are programming uh, v Visual Basic is a programming language, is, uh, language in Microsoft's products. Um, it lets you run code. So if you can run code in a Word document, why not? Let's just download and execute software uh, or malware and then install onto the computer. So that's one example. It wasn't intended for that, but it's very easy to do. And then you have um, uh, DDE, that's a typo, 
or mouse hovering within PowerPoint or all kinds of little features inside the program which let you install um, things. That's kind of the, the landscape of, of these things. Yeah, so um, in uh, PowerPoint, there's like a, a function, a functionality. It's like very, this is very like uh, intricate. If you put your mouse on top of uh, a link, so PowerPoint lets you execute a command based just because maybe you want to do something when someone hovers over the link. So what they do is just run a command and download and execute malware. They can, it's, that's the idea of logical bugs. Just find little places, new places to insert your download and execute command and then you can find it, how to get it. Okay, so, um, why, okay, so we've, talk, we've, we've spoken um, a bit about high level about how the whole techniques and how they work. Let's just look at uh, a bit of examples um, and then uh, we'll, di deep, like we'll dive deep into how to actually do these things. Okay, so the first example is um, there are actually two vulnerabilities that came out um, recently in uh, Internet Explorer. And um, the reason I'm talking about this is because um, they used a, uh, um, an exploitation technique um, in order to, to exploit this. Um, the one here is called use after free. Um, what they do is these two vulnerabilities are very, very similar. That's why they're interesting because one came out um, and they're associated with the APT group called Dark Hotel, which people say they're from North Korea, or the, the industry says. Um, so what, what do we see here? We see attackers um, b uh, backed by North Korea, um, are, they sit, they find a vulnerability in um, Microsoft, or a browser, in this case it's Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer, and then they exploit it, uh, they write an exploit, and this is the actual exploit code, it's a bit obfuscated, why is it obfuscated? For the tech, the, um, previously we spoke about how static signatures are used to identify malware. So if you just, every time you change it, obfuscation is means, it means changing the, the input. If you change it every time, so um, you can't take, uh, you can't look at this. You can't sign it or you can't detect it. So then, but the, but the point that I'm trying to get to is that these two attacks still leverage the same exploitation technique, which was a use after free technique. So at the end of the day, they are, um, they do connect at a common, uh, common source. And we're gonna talk about why this is important. Um, okay, another one was um, just examples of attacks, right? Of memory corruption attacks. So the previous one was a memory corruption. This one as well, um, they say uh, it's a Russian cyber espionage group called um, APT28. Uh, they found vulnerabilities in memory corruption vulnerabilities in Microsoft Word, um, in the font parsing uh, mechanism, and then using these memory corruption bugs, they just sent you a document, uh, you double clicked it, and it ran code on your machine. Um, this actually was very advanced because it had two, th there were three vulnerabilities in, involved, like two separate ones for the Word, and then they had to, uh, to gain access to the actual operating system itself and install themselves, which was in the Windows kernel um, as well. So the, this is like really, um, you can really see that whoever wrote this thing, these are guys that sat down. Um, it's a team of people, obviously, and, uh, and they really did a, a good work. <laughs> um, okay, another thing that we've um, we spotted is, this is like on the logical bug side. This is like why we're talking about this. So memory corruption versus logical bugs. And then, here, what these guys did, uh, they're saying it's Chinese-based backed um, APT. Uh, they're taking or attacking Mon uh, Mongolia-based victims. And the idea here is that it was fileless, but we're gonna dive a bit more into it. Look what happened, they sent the, the victim, they sent him a link, okay? So here's a link to a Google Drive. And then the Google Drive hosted a zip. Inside the zip, it contained a file that looked like a PDF, but it was actually a LNK file. The LNK file triggered a Windows mechanism that which went to, back to the internet, found a Visual Basic script, downloaded it, and then executed it, and then that thing was malicious in itself. It didn't actually write anything to disk, so it was a fileless, mal fileless malware. But the idea here is that no memory corruption was used, just um, kind of, uh, playing around with features and just running code on the machine, making people click links and that will cause uh, the machine to, to be hacked. 
Um, so it's it's pretty interesting. Does any have anyone have questions up until now? Cool. Okay. So now we're going to talk about. So yeah, sure. Um, it, it, there, they just changed the icon of the the file. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's another. There's uh, there. I mean, we can talk. There's another technique where you can. Um, Kind of a, it's called a left to right or right to left, right? So in English you write in one direction, and then let's say in Hebrew we write from the other direction. So you can uh, change directions in the middle and, and write PDF, but actually, at, uh, um, yeah, and you write PDF, but the actual operating system looks at the end, which says L and K. But you, as a user, are only seeing in. There's an icon of PDF, and it says uh, nice file dot PDF, and then you just don't know that the the rest it ends with L and K. Yeah, there's, it's just like all kind of tricks and tips to. Uh, that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, okay, so now let's look at, um, so we talked about these are kind of the logical bug stuff, and now we're gonna go into the, um, the exploitations and the techniques. So let's start with a bit of history. In the 90s, um, we had what we call buffer overflows. Um, so what the attacker does is that he finds a vulnerability in the code. Okay, so I always, I always start with finding a, vul a vulnerability. I don't go into uh, I haven't gone into how you find vulnerabilities, and I'm not going to talk about it, but that is a whole, whole discussion um, and, and a lot, a lot of time to, to go in and, and dive into that kind of uh, stuff. It's very interesting. But let's, given a vulnerability, these techniques now are how the, the attacker um, gains execution of, um, of the CPU. So in, in these kind of attacks back in the 90s, the input would be either placed on uh, memory regions called the stack or the heap, um, and then what the attacker would do is he would, uh, the bug itself is that it overflows, which means uh, the program kind of miswrites uh, over its own um, control flow uh, parameters. W what does that mean? The way the program works is that the stack is used always as a reference. So let's say the code is here. So now the code always, the CPU always jumps in between the code in order to execute the logic. So let's say it jumped from here to here. So he's going to save in this place. He says, all right, I'm going to write down where I left off here so that when I'm finished doing here, I'm going to come back. And then he writes it down. And then it, it kind of works. I like calling it like a babushka, like a, those matryoshka dolls. So like I jumped into a function, I wrote down. I jumped into another function, I wrote down. Jumped into, and then it kind of unrolls. And that's how the CPU works. It, it kind of jumps. That's how program execution works. Um, what, the, what the, the programmer didn't think about, or the system, the guys who designed this, like, uh, this kind of architecture in the first place is that what happens if these, these um, remembering notes of where you left off are now altered by someone else. And that's the essence of uh, the vulnerability. The vulnerability gives the attacker um, the option to alter these, uh, these um, notes. And then what he does is he just redirects the traffic, uh, the traffic, he just redirects the, the execution to his own code. So, and that's it, game over. Like that's where the attacker already runs his own code. And then from from our kind of conversation in this room is that once you've written your your own code, you can do whatever you want. Um, there's a whole industry in the security world that deals with how to identify if code that is running is bad or good. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the essence of when that that hijacking happens. That's it. It's basically game over. Um, cool. Okay. So who can think? Um, I'll take it back a second. Who can think how we stop these kind of attacks? Yeah. ASLR. A okay, so ASLR came a bit later, by the way, uh, which means there's, it's a bit more of a, we have to learn a bit more for that, but how does the attacker know where the code is in the memory? How does he know where to jump to? So, yeah. In the instruction, right? So back at, um, what he would do is just put an address ahead of time that he knew that would be there, and then ASLR said, all right, let's move it around. But ASLR hasn't really been proven to be useful once you have like another vulnerability that just leaks information. Or it, re it also really depends on the type of vulnerability. Um, but that's, that's, that's good. Is there some, there's something much more basic. Yeah, so protected memory, that, that's a good one. Um, the stack and the heap aren't meant to be running code. You're not supposed to run code from them. That's like the essence of it. So it's actually AMD came out with it, um, but Intel uh, after also supported it. It's called the no execution bit. Okay. So it's, think about putting like a quarantine ribbons around uh, the memory and sorry, sorry man, you can't, once the CPU comes to execute code from there, everyone stop, you're not allowed to run code from here. That's good. Um, we showed you before that, uh, that graph. So the graph that we spoke about here. So that technique is this one. 
right here in 2002 came out. And then we started seeing um, the exploits in the wild uh, go down because attackers didn't really know how to bypass this kind of um, what we call mitigation. Um, it's very, uh, an interesting uh, caveat here is that this mitigation is at the hardware level, okay? So a hardware level solution really did bring an end to, um, to buffer overflows or what we call uh, code injection attacks. Um, there were other attempts at the software level. Uh, one of them was um, stack cookies, and there's uh, like five variants of those that, uh, that um, mitigation, software level mitigation that came out back in those years. Um, SE uh, protections were also popular back then. Um, and they didn't really, they, they, they did help, but given the vulnerability and your, um, the movement, when you have a vulnerability at hand, you can bypass this. The annex bit um, was pretty hard to bypass, but everything is bypassable in this world. That's the, the beauty of the computers. There's always like a can and mouse game. Um, so what the next attack was in order, okay, so the attacker said, okay, cool. So if I cannot inject my own code into the program, why don't I use the existing code that's already there. Okay, so it's pretty cool. The idea is like, um, uh, like a ransom letter is, is sent to people where they take a newspaper, they take a letters out of the newspaper and then write a new sentence out of existing uh, words. So that's the concept here. What the attacker would do is that he would inject, um, remember those notes that the program uses where to remember to go back to? So he basically gives him the CPU new notes and says, here, these are your notes, now start executing them. So that's the idea behind uh, code reuse attacks, and there's three impl implementations of them, ROP, COP, and JOP. Um, the, uh, the difference between them is what control flow um, opcode in the um, that they abuse. ROP abuses return, or, um, program, um, return instructions. COP uh, abuses call-oriented programming, call instructions, and JOP is jump-oriented programming. Um, so that's basically uh, the idea behind uh, these code reuse attacks. Is, um, anyone have uh, questions about this stuff? Okay, feel free to just stop me as well in, uh, during uh, the... So now, basically we are... This happened in 2007. Um, officially, I mean, I mean, there are new things, but officially um, an academic paper came out written by Chovav Shacham from uh, University of Santa Barbara, I think, where he formally proved that this thing is uh, true and complete and that he can do any computation with it. And then that's basically what we see today in attacks. So what an attacker would do is leverage a vulnerability, inject code, do code reuse, turn off the, this. He turns that off, and then he runs the, the old code. Every technique always enables the one that was previous to it. That's the kind of idea behind it. OK, but the game continues. Um, in 2016, Intel introduced or announced um, something that they're working on called Intel CET, Control Flow Enforcement Technology. And the idea is to observe those ROP, COP, and JOP attacks. What are they going to be doing in CET? Um, they're going to, remember the, the CPU always uses the stack in order to remember where it wrote from. So um, the hardware now, the CPU is going to have another copy of that stack in the hardware level, again, it's a hardware level solution, in where he writes, if the software wrote, then, then this thing is also gonna write. And then if you wrote, there, and now every time a control flow um, uh, uh, opcode is executed by the CPU, the shadow stack or the sh at the hardware level is consulted and compared, and if there's a deviation, then probably there's an attack. That's kind of the idea. So do you get it? Like, um, if, if the CPU is now returning to places, you're always comparing it with another, with more notes that you wrote uh, ahead of time. So the CPU wrote where it's supposed to go to, and then it came to execute, but if the attacker changed it in the meantime, he couldn't change the other stack, which is mimicking it, the shadow stack, and therefore, uh, once you compare it, you can detect that there's a, some, the, there was an attack. So that's on the return oriented. On the jump and the cop, um, what they did is um, they're gonna just single out places inside the code where you're allowed to transfer execution to. So now what the attackers were doing is they were just jumping in the middle of programs, like just, just like a, the, the, that's another thing on x86 here, you can jump into middle of opcodes. So in this, uh, in the, so which basically means you can find as whatever program that you want to run 
uh, you can generate it in, and, and find how to piece together pieces of the code because there's enough code inside there. Um, now what they're doing is they're limiting the attacker's options in order where he can jump to. So that's uh, what they're doing and they're enforcing it at the hardware level. Um, so um, that's how COP and JOP um, are stopped. Basically it's just saying that you can't look at the whole program, you can only look at certain parts of it. Yeah, if the attacker finds a way into the shadow stack, then it will be vulnerable. The, the stronghold of, of, of that point, which I would argue, would be that it's implemented in the hardware, and therefore it's going to be way harder for him to access that with his limited resources, because he's already leveraging a vulnerability. It really depends on the vulnerability that he, but that, that's the name of the game, right? So if he has a vulnerability that does give him access into high privileged code, he might be able to. It really depends on the scenario. But again, this, this world of the, atta the, the hackers and the, the cat and mouse is always just to make it to raise the bar, to raise the bar, to raise the bar. Yeah, that's exactly the, the approach. Um, cool, so CET came out and everyone was happy. Yay, the end of uh, code reuse attacks. Cop, Rop, and Jop are going to die. Even though this thing has not been printed yet in Silicon, it's yet to come, I think, into 2020. Um, Intel will start printing CPUs with these features. Uh, embedded inside, and then Windows and Linux are going to have to recompile themselves and and then support this kind of stuff. So it's going to take a while, but then once it is, what's in the bar is going to be raised. Yeah. So like, say you load a new program, you start up your OS, you load Microsoft Office. Say again, you start a new program. You start up, you start up your operating system, mm -hmm. and then you load Microsoft Office. Yeah. Now, but when you load Microsoft Office, it's going to need to write into this thing into the stack where it's Code. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. So how does the shadow stack know to take a good copy of the shadow, right? So there must be a command inside that office or OS yeah. to make that happen. That's true. So all the attacker needs to do is leverage that command to tell it to copy this attack of the shadow stack. Ah, uh, you're saying, okay, how are they going to bypass it? Well, th th yeah, this is, this is a potential bypass. Ah, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, I mean, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't... Uh, because there has to be some way of making that shadow stack um, copy the normal stack, right? So, yeah. So, when you launch a, a program, mm -hmm. so, so that program puts its stuff into the stack, you have to be able to take the stack so uh, apparently the CPU is supposed to be tracing the ret command, okay, and which means all the C all the program did was every time it did a return address, then the CPU would be doing this behind the scenes. So the whole point is that you don't have access to, it. and then because you don't have access into it, so why are there a lot of false positive? But let's not get into the uh, implementation of it. But there's a lot of problems with that because. Um, there's problems with, uh, they said, uh, task swi uh, um, switching. Yeah, what happens if you switch a thread in the middle and then how does the stack know to, to it, those kind of stuff. So the Windows kernel will take this stuff into consideration and therefore he needs to support this thing. Okay? Um, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you how they broke it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the, the academic world, trust the academic world, um, they're always on top of their things. I said, right, exploitation techniques come out once, uh, th these things come out slowly, but they're, they're very nice when, when, uh, when they come out. Okay, so the next, and more bad news, right, advanced code reuse attacks, these are the new, uh, uh, the new guys in town. Um, they're, they, we call them co-op, uh, lop, and dop, right, so counter freight object programming, I'm, I'm going to get into that, uh, loop-oriented programming and data-oriented programming. The idea, all right, so let's, let's just, let's uh, thoroughly look a bit better um, at the previous, uh, this, this thing. Okay, so what is a, pro, what is a program? Pro, a program essentially is a graph, right? So a programmer writes his uh, code in uh, whatever language he wants to, and then it's always compiled into um, a, a machine language, right, uh, assembly. Um, x86 in, in this example, uh, or the world that we're now talking about. And then essentially what it is, it's, a base, it's, it's just a bunch of basic blocks, right? So b basic blocks is, a basic block is defined as just a uh, piece of code that um, is jumped into and then it ends by a control flow, like by jumping out. And that's how you implement logic, right? So an if is like there's a, ba there's a piece of code that's run and then it decides if it jumps that way or if it jumps that way, that's how you do logic basically. 
like go that way or go that way. And that's all program is. It's just a bunch of these things, a very, very big graph, but just with a lot of control flows between them. All these techniques that we're talking about are always trying to make sure that the jumping between these blocks are done legally. Okay, that's like the, this, whole in, this whole thing in the academic world, it's called CFI, control flow integrity, right? The integrity of the graph. The CPU basically travels the graph in runtime. That's what a program is, okay? So um, ROP, what, what was ROP, um, what, what were they doing here in ROP? Or JOP or COP? At the end of every basic block, when it, ca it came to jump somewhere else, they said the, the attacker made it jump into the middle of a different basic block. Okay? You're not gonna do that, right? So, so who is auditing you in runtime? And these are these, these are these techniques, these hardware level techniques that we're talking about. Um, so the first one said, sorry, you can't even jump into that, base, uh, that block, that piece of code you're not allowed to jump into. That's the no execution bit that we spoke about in the beginning. And then uh, this came out, right? So just jump into existing ones. Because, yeah, sorry, I mixed you up a bit, but yeah. Because of this? Um, <coughs> ah, <laughs> nice. right, so, yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, if, if you're not allowed to execute that, so then that would make it be sense. I agree. Um, so I, I kind of went, uh, um, I just wanted to explain this idea more thoroughly. So basically, the, um, this technique, the CET, make sure that the, 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 the edges, right, the lines between the graphs, the big graph, is being jumped into legal areas. So every time a basic block wants to jump to another place, it's jumping to a legal place that it's allowed to do according to certain rules which were defined in this thing. So what did the attackers do now in the new evolution of this thing? They conform to the graph. That's the, the basic uh, thing. All right, so they say, all right, all right, fine. We're not going to do any illegal jumping. All we're going to do now is jump into different um, uh, basic blocks in a different order. And a side effect of these, this execution flow is going to, we're going to leverage a side effect in order to turn off the previous thing. And then that's how the game goes, basically. Um, so does it make sense? So the side effect, it really, that really depends on what they're abusing. So um, they can, a side effect would be to load a, a dynamic module, which uh, allocates a read-write-execute memory, and then write your shellcode into there and jump there. But it was all done legitimately, basically. Uh, another side effect would be, to your question, you cannot turn off the shadow stack. So I, I mean, I, I haven't dealt with this kind of stuff yet because it doesn't exist. <laughs> but uh, to turn, maybe they would be able to turn off the shadow stack feature, just like you can turn off uh, the no execution bit by calling it an API that's already inside the program that just tells the, the CPU that this basic block is allowed to be executed or, or something like that. But the essence is that they can control, um, the, they can conform to the graph, which the other attacks didn't, so now they do and they leverage a different side effect. The side effect in co-op is done on C++ um, objects in memory. So what they do is they overlay the C++ objects in, inside the memory and then they run normal code, no more code, no more basic blocks, which create changes um, in the RAM or whatever into different objects and then they maybe can call into another function that will load another thing. Like, it, it makes the game, again, way harder, but it opens up a new vector for an exploitation, tech, like an, an exploitation vector. Um, it's very, very new, and therefore, uh, there's a couple of blogs. We wrote a blog about it. A company called Endgame wrote a, a blog about it on how you leverage co-op to uh, run code. So the first so, attack was like if you, whatever, malicious string, which holds the flaws, which then writes down to the point that I, that I actually uh, would call them Place on the stack where it knows it's being. The rest was I, I re I, I changed the jumps so that I jump around and, and find the code I need. Yeah. And now I bring the program to reload that malicious block, a, a block which is as a complete now malicious. A new block because I now can only reload a whole block, which needs to be marked as executable. Yeah, th that's. And the whole block I need to have predefined somewhere, somewhere delivered before. 
so that it can reload it and execute it. Okay, so you, you got it until the, right, right. So they're going to use this stuff to conform to the graph. So they can run code that it conforms to the graph. There we agree on this, right? Yeah. Now the way they leverage that to execute code, we'll talk about that later. I want to give you more examples and, and go more into it, but uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit more trickier. The essence of it is, uh, is finding, um, abusing uh, natural things that the program would have done, which is allocate, read, write, execute memory for itself. Right, so it, it, re it really becomes application specific, like browsers uh, use JIT code or um, uh, Office can load .NET. You malicious string, but then you use a program to, uh, to basically allocate this block where you just have data to now say, now it's a read-write block. Yes, jump. right, but the way you did it was by, com um, by conforming, conforming to the graph. By using the, okay. Yeah, exactly. Conforming the graph is not going to fully in my head how it would be. So th this, is not a co this is not to conform to the graph, yep. ROP, right? And this thing is to enforce it. So they said, all right, cool. We're, we're doing it normally, just we're, the side effects of what we're going to do by conforming to the graph is functionality that's already in there. So I basically look for a block. Yeah, a, a bigger block. Which would change, so I look for, uh, I look for already existing a preferred block, which would change the read-write of an area for sure, but that's already, uh, yeah. And then change the area. Yes. And the, the area that is uh, changed by the block so that I have no control. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's already, per, that second part of the conversation was per application. So it will change in different, depends on what you're attacking. Just yeah. one example. Yeah, understand. exactly. Um, and it's an interesting th to talk about that a bit more. Um, cool. So that's the status today. Okay, so um, just to recap, we spoke about how the attackers um, would f look for um, uh, in the scape of the cyber world to, right, to attack someone and then prepare everything and then find a vulnerability and then this is how what we just spoke about now is how they actually hijack the CPU, all these techniques and how the industry uh, has been countering these kind of techniques and this is the essence of how people hack into computers in the memory corruption world. Like that's, that's what goes on and how, um, and how the defenders are trying to defend and, and, and these things evolve very, very slowly. That's another interesting point. Um, okay, so now um, the industry, okay, so just a bit about this. Okay, so now, okay, this goes into another subject. How did the industry, I spoke about before about, um, oh wow, really? Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the industry goes into, we said statically it finds, um, it looks for, to compare, uh, uh, do I know this thing beforehand? And then that's what we call static. And then that didn't really, really prove well, so then it went into behavior. The behavior world is what we call sandboxing which means we look at a program, how it executes. Remember I spoke about once a program is running, it's very, very, very hard to do this. So this is a very hard problem. And therefore, looking at exploitation techniques is a much more deterministic in a black and white world as opposed to trying to classify software in runtime to see if it's bad or good. So how do, um, so now we're going into the attacker's head again, at the stage of once he's already installed malware and done all this exploitation technique, how he's going to evade potential um, uh, defenses that are trying to say that he's bad. So the first example would be you can just uh, go to sleep, right? So once we're writing code, let's just uh, um, not run anything for 20 minutes, for five hours, and then after five hours we'll resume. Why do we do this? Because there's an inspection time in where um, those behavior things that I was talking about would look at you. So if they're not looking at you for more than two minutes, then, um, then they won't detect you. That's kind of the idea behind sleeping. Um, there's, okay, we, sh we showed a good example before about deep sophisticated packaging and where they send you a link which looks like this and that it sends you all over the place and then it attacks you. Um, clicked when triggered and, okay, we're just gonna have to run over this. So the complex packaging is, is what we spoke about. Um, so that if, if uh, the defender has a limited number of resources, so then if they're um, making the, the input look very, very complicated so he's not going to be able to have enough resources to evaluate everything and then he's going to have to skip stuff. So that's a problem. Um, they can go to sleep like we said. And then this is running microcode doing the sleep things. 
um, there's um, there's detecting there's and there's all kind of detecting which I'm running over because I don't have enough time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you have more than two monitors, then I won't tech you if you only have one monitor. So sorry. <laughs> um, okay, and then there's all kind of ways of uh, detecting hypervisors, which is also interesting, but we don't have time. Um, so basically, to wrap it up. Um, okay, so about the, the um, just, just to wrap up the previous thing before we, we finish. Um, so evasion techniques can be done because at that stage there's exploitation techniques and then there's the code, the runner, the bad guy runs the code, the attacker runs the code, and then in the code he can do whatever he wants and because he can do whatever he wants so then he chooses to, to run according to certain different things and it's very, very hard, it's a hard problem to classify software to say it's bad or good. So what's our approach at perception point, just in a nutshell? Um, this is our platform, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what we've done is we've leveraged uh, CPU tracing um, capabilities in, uh, in CPUs in order to gain visibility into what that CPU is actually executing in runtime. And because we look at this level, we can see the CFG graph and then we can see if the jumps are, are doing good. So basically, um, if there's a maze, so there's left and right, and um, so the, attacker go, the program goes left and right inside the maze, but what the attacker does is he'll jump over a wall. Right, those, like, that's basically what we spoke about the, off the time. So we can see the jumping over the walls and then that's how we can see that it's uh, malicious. And these are the types of uh, algorithms that we've done, which is uh, to counter all those kind of uh, evolution that we spoke about. Um, okay, this is just for reference about how slowly the, the exploitation technique um, come out and then every technique where the years and who did it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's basically it. You know, so, any questions? Um, this is the time. Or, uh, yeah, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> Sorry for running up in the end. Okay, great guys, thank you.